There's a lot of anger right now. Lots of talk of walls being raised up and knocked down. And whether reverence is best expressed waving from a pole or kneeling on the ground. There's a lot of fear right now. Lots of lives wondering if they matter enough not to be gunned down or drowned out by the sound of the crowd. But you, you're here right now for such a time as this because the answer lives in you. It guides you. It whispers reminders in a climate defined by violence and polarizing half-truths that are really just full lies. It inspires you to forgive, to let it go, to hold fast, to wash their feet because the veil was torn and you can clearly see that Jesus died and rose again that we may all be free. Your bones aren't dry anymore. So go. This truth is good news. You may have to leave someone behind for, give up your privilege for, sacrifice your reputation for, but the freedom is worth so much more. And now that you have tasted and seen, you can't help but to pick up your cross and go. Come on, somebody. I know somebody is ready to answer the call of God to follow Jesus in every area of your life. If that's you, can you make some noise one more time? This is real Christianity. Somebody that follows Jesus, his example, what he did in his life. He says that we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world because he is the light of the world. The Bible calls us as the church, his body. We are to be a living expression of who Jesus is. That means we gotta follow his example. That's the call, not just to do church, not just to come here on Sunday, but to say, Jesus, I'm gonna follow you and your example in every area of my life. And so we're gonna finish this series, but we're not gonna finish following him today. We're gonna finish this series with a message called The Call to Go Fishing. The Call to Go Fishing. I have one yes, Lord. I think he's the only one who likes to fish. Charles, are you the only one who likes to go fishing? All right, anybody else like... Any other fishermen in this? Okay, there we go. Fisher women. Okay, you guys like to fish, a few of you. All right. I was wondering who was going to get real excited about fishing, but I guess it's not you this morning. I guess I got to go to some country church, talk about fishing. No, um, when I was a kid, I lived next to a guy who owned three acres of land. He was a young guy. Uh, his family, I should say. He didn't own it. His family owned three acres of land. And right in the backyard, he had this creek just running through the backyard that led to a pond on the other side of the neighborhood. And I can't tell you how many times Josh Chocolate is his name. We, he would call and he said, hey, you want to go fishing? And I'm like, yeah, let's go fishing. And we just love to fish. So we would take nets. We would take fishing poles. And we would even take our bare hands and we would catch whatever we could find. So we got frogs, we got snakes, we got crawdads, we got sticks. You know how many guys fishermen, you know what I'm saying, like reeling in one of them big sticks. I mean, we, we would try to catch anything, including fish. And, and so whenever he would call and he would be like, hey, you want to go fishing? I'd call him. Hey, you want to go fishing? Let's go do it. We had so much anticipation to see what was going to be on the other side. Maybe that bobber just being taken under by one of them fish and the excitement of that and reeling them in and looking at the net. Once we pull the net out of the creek, see what we got. And, and, and that really expresses what Jesus is talking about following him is all about in this area in, in Matthew 4, 18 through 20. He's talking about some of the same terminology. He's mentioning fishing here and following him. Let's talk about what, what he's really saying here in Matthew 4, 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, one Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. Remember, that's the call that we're answering in the series. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men or fishers of people. That means if we're following Jesus, that means we're going to be fishing for people. That means if we're not fishing for people, we're probably not what? I want you to catch that. He says, follow me and you'll be a fisher of men. That means if we are following him, that's what we're going to do. And if we're not doing that, 
may be an indicator we're not really following him in every area of our life. So he's calling these two fishermen to say, put down your nets and come and follow me and you'll, you'll fish for people. Straightway, right away, they left their nets and they began to follow him. I want you to catch this. In this thing called being a disciple of Jesus Christ, one of the main things that we're to do in following him is following the master's example. What did Jesus say he came to do? He says, I came to seek and save the lost. If we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to go after lost people. Because Jesus' heart, his desire, what he, what he is thinking about over and over again every day are those people that don't know him, that are lost and wayward, that their lives are a wreck maybe because of it. And so he's thinking about them and he's, he's throwing out this question to his people that are called Christians. He said, will you follow me? And go after those people that I came and that I died for? Would you go and do an outreach like a trunk or tree to go after some people that are out here that don't know you? Would you come and would you start a food pantry to, to kind of build a bridge to some people that are far away from me? This is following Jesus. It's being a fisher of people. And if we're going to do that and we're going to do it well, we got to learn some tips. You know, if you're going to fish and you're going to be a good fisher person, I should say not a fisher man, that's, that's sexist. That's sexist pastor. All right. All right. A fisher person, because anybody can be a fisher person. Um, if you're going to do that, if you're going to be a good one, you got to learn some tips, don't you? we got to learn some tips. So I want to share with you three fishing tips to be a better fisher of people. And we're going to pull this out of this scripture that we just read. The first fishing tip, you guys ready for this this morning, is that we need to go to where the fish are. We got to go to where the fish are. My buddy Josh Chocolate and I, we went down to the creek because that's where the fish and the, and the crawdads and everything else were. We went down to the pond because that's where they were. And it wasn't just that we went down to it or on the side of it. Man, how many of you guys know that fish are good at hiding? You know, they're sometimes in cubby holes and, and their own little nests and that type of thing. And so sometimes you got to get good at kind of getting into the water. Anybody ever go fly fishing? You got to put on those, you know, uh, big old waders and like go out there into the water. And you got to get into their mess in order to catch them. I can't tell you how many times I come home and mom's like, you better shower and hose off before you ever come in here. Because we were in the pond, like we were up in the fish's business so that we could catch them, Right. You know, this is not what the church in large part is doing today in this thing called fishing for people. We, we look at it this way. Let's just hang out. This is, the, this is the evangelism of the modern age. Let's hang out in our church building and then expect the fish to come fish for us. Let's just hang out here in church, you know, in our comfort zones. We don't really want to get too messy, Pastor. After all, those are sinners out there. And so we really don't want to do any life with them. They're, I mean, they're going to rub off on us and, and that type of thing. And so, so we want to hang out in the holy place. Yet I thought this was about being a follower of Jesus. Didn't Jesus leave the cleanliness of heaven and come down to earth in the dirtiness of this world and in this life? So a follower of Jesus is going to leave some comfort zones behind and they're going to go out to where the fish are waiting, maybe even out into the deep, even into the dirty places because they're ready to go and catch some fish. Amen. And this is what God's calling us to do because the only fish I know that will ever just jump into your lap are flying fish. You guys know flying fish? You ever, you ever see any of the movie where these fish fly and they like jump into your boat and you're like, oh man, I got a fish, Whatever. Those are the only fish, and you still got to go out to the water even to, to have them jump into your boat. But I look, at that, I look at that as a way to explain much of the church growth today, that we're just having fish jump from one aquarium to another aquarium. We're just trading church people. I call this Uncle Bill's Christianity because we're just going to where other church people are, and we're saying, hey, come to this church because we got cooler music and we got a cooler pastor, and so we're just stealing church people. We're taking them from one aquarium to another aquarium. No, we got to go out to where the, where the fish are. We got to be the people that catch the fish, right? That's real following Jesus. That's what Jesus really did. He came to where we are. And how many of you guys are thankful that he met you right in your dirt, right in your mess, right in the middle of your nasty, right? And he came after you and he might have used 
another Christian to help teach you or share with you the gospel. You know, Andrew, one of these brothers that we see here uh, that was a fisherman, right after this portion of scripture, you see Andrew going and telling other people, hey man, I just saw this guy named Jesus and I'm telling you, this dude is a real deal. I need you to come and check him out with me. Andrew didn't have a doctorate in theology. I told you that already in this series. Andrew just started following Jesus. And immediately he was going to tell somebody else, you need to come to church with me. (laughs) You need to come and hear this guy, man, because there's something about it. He's speaking to me things that I've never seen or heard before. See, we don't have to be really seasoned in Christ. We don't have to be in church for a long time to be a fisher of people. We just need to know that Jesus has saved me. And I just got to go and tell somebody that he can do the same thing in your life. But sometimes it takes us getting out of our comfort zone, even going to the dangerous places. And that reminds me of the show called Deadliest Catch. Anybody ever see that show, Deadliest Catch? Man, it's a cool show, man. You just need to watch one episode and watch how these guys go out to the Bering Sea, right in the middle of somewhere in Alaska, and they get hit with waves that are like 40 foot tall and are ice cold. They're in the craziest of conditions, and they go out there, and it's called Deadliest Catch. They're willing to brave all of these conditions because that's where the king crabs are. That's where the king crabs are. That's where they're at. And so they will go and brave all of the conditions. They will leave their comfort zones. They will even leave their family for a time to go out there on this boat for months at a time just so that they can catch some king crab. I think this speaks to us as the church. There are some king crabs in this community. There's some king crabs in Indianapolis. There's some king crabs throughout this world. And Jesus is saying, well, you just go for me. Who, who, who will go for me? Whom shall I send? Who's going to go for me to tell these people about what I did for them through my son, Jesus? I hope it's you this morning saying, Lord, here am I. Like Isaiah said, send me. I'm willing to go even to brave the tough conditions. I'm willing to go and get the deadliest catch and lose my life for the gospel of Jesus. I'm willing just to even tell my neighbor next door. See, many times we're talking about missions in church, and I'm about to. I'm going to talk about the 1040 window, which is at 10 latitude and 40 latitude on the map. I have a picture right here. This is where uh, the majority of lost fish are in this world, okay? Folks that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. There aren't a ton of, uh, of churches in this region. And so I'm about, to, I'm about to share a moving and a compelling thing of why the church has to go to this area. But before we go into all the world, Maybe we just need to go to our neighbor's house and knock on their door and say, hey, you know what? I just want to share with you about my friend Jesus. You know, what he did in my life and how I was lost and how he found me and how my life was a wreck. And I'm still not all the way there, but Jesus is, I'm I'm telling you, he's changing me day in and day out. And I just wanted, I just want you to know that. And they might look at you a little weird, a little twisted. And I'm going to get to some things of how we can put some bait and some good tactics around our sharing of our faith. But isn't it that simple, guys? We just got to go and tell somebody. And before we may go to the other parts of the world, maybe we just need to go to our neighbor's house, our coworker, somebody that we know is struggling with some things and say, you know what? I got a Jesus who is the solution. He is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. He is the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. But that might mean that we go into all the world like Mark 16, 15 says. Look at Mark 16, 15. We're going to go back to, back to the map after this. He says to them, this is Jesus, go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. This is following Jesus because that's what he did. And now he's telling us as his followers, his disciples, to go and do the same thing. Now, all the world means yes here in Indianapolis. Yes to to the outreach that we're doing here. Yes to this community. But it also may mean that God might put it on your heart as a follower of Jesus to go to a mission field in another country like this 1040 window. Let's go back to this map. This 1040 window is on my heart because we're talking about the deadliest catch and going to where the fish are. I want you to think about this because if we don't even go, at least we can support missionaries there. Maybe we can start praying for this region, for God to send forth laborers into this field. You know, the Bible says the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth people. So check this out. In this region, 10 latitude, 40 latitude on the map. You got 3.4 billion people that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 3.4 billion, that's with the B, okay? 
That's a lot of people. And this region particularly is lacking the gospel because it's a very persecuted region. All right, so in 2015, 90,000 Christians followed Jesus and his call to follow him. They followed Jesus, just like what Onyeka was saying, even to death. 90,000 Christians were martyred, killed for their faith in 2015 alone. 90,000. Many of those, or much of those, was in this region of the world because there were other religions that were persecuting them, other terrorist groups, other things, uh, where Christianity is illegal. And so this is a deadly area. It's a deadliest catch, if you will, yet Christ is still calling. He died for those people just like he died for us. We're, we're, we're experiencing the benefit of our ancestors, our forefathers in this nation that came and founded a nation where there would be religious freedom. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah, not just for Christians, but for any other religion not to be persecuted for their faith and that type of thing. Thank God so we can worship here freely this morning. But all over the world and specifically in this area of the world, there are lost people by the billions. And Christ is just saying, who's going to go for me? Who's going to follow me there? Now, there are people there, obviously, that do believe in Jesus that are going there, but it's a deadly area, so there's a deadliest catch situation. So would you join me in prayer for our brothers and sisters? Would you join me for prayer for those who are being persecuted for their faith in this region? Would you join me in prayer for them? And would you be sensitive to the Lord? So what do he wants you to do? Does he want you to go? Does he want you to support there? Does he want you to pray? I don't know, but God will stir this up in people because he's just calling. That's what we're talking about in this whole series. He's calling. But maybe you might be the one, at least we're all called to pray for this region. But I want you to think about that. That's, that is this region of the world. This is Mark 16, 15 to these people. Go into this part of the world and go after them because that's where the fish are. But it's also here locally. Look at what Luke 14, 23 says. Luke 14, 23 says, and the master's talking about Jesus giving a parable of lost people. He says, the master said to the servant, go into the highways and the hedges. Another version says highways and byways, wherever people are, no matter where they're at, in the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. Now, remember, we're talking about most modern evangelism. We're trying to get people just to come to our building. But no, listen, lost people are out there. And in order for us to get them in here, we have to go fishing where they are. We got to go fishing where they are. And so that means we got to go sometimes to the hedges. <laughs> that means where the people are hiding out, maybe in their sinful behavior or in the club or wherever they're at on the street, maybe in, again, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, wherever people are that we know just need good news. That's what the gospel means. It's a good news. How many of you guys know that good news to somebody whose sin is separating them from God is that Jesus Christ came to die for their sins so they don't have to be separated from this God who loves them and wants a relationship with them. That's good news, right? Amen? That's really, really good news. So we gotta go and find them and we gotta go where they are. And so that's the first point. And that means the highways, the byways, that means even the 1040 window, we gotta go where they are. Even if that means we lose our comforts and it's kind of a little dirty and a little messy over there, we're still gonna go. Let me talk to you about the second fishing tip. The second fishing tip is that we got to use the right bait and tackle. We got to use the right bait and the right tools in order to really bring these fish in. Some fish, if you guys know anything about fishing at all, and if you don't, you're going to get a little education about fishing in here this morning. Some fish like spinners. They like spinner baits like bass. Some sea creatures like those king crab. They, they really are only caught through a net, you know, and maybe some bait that's in the middle of that net to bring them in. Some other fish like hot dogs. Man, them Oscar Mayer winners. <laughs> M-E-Y, yeah, I don't know there's a song to that, but I ain't gonna sing it this morning, okay? Who would have known that fish would like Oscar Mayer winners? My mom has a pond behind her house about 100 yards uh, long, and so it's not too big of a pond, but I'm telling you, these fish in this pond love some hot dogs. You throw a little piece of hot dog on that, on that hook, you throw that pole out there, and a fish in no time is going to take that hot dog hook, line, and sinker. I never knew that hot dogs would be that good of a bait, but for some reason in my mom's backyard, somebody must have been grilling one time, dropped a hot dog. You know, ever been to grilling and drop a hot dog, and so they just threw it in the lake, and them fish were like, yeah, hot dogs, let's go. And so now they've always been eating hot dogs ever since. 
Now, as I was thinking about fish liking hot dogs and using hot dogs for bait, I was thinking about an outreach that our church did just last Saturday right here in Bates Hendricks, which is the next neighborhood just north of us. And uh, so Diversity Church, a few of our people, some of our cell group leaders, we went out because again, that's where the fish are. We went out to Bates Hendricks and we set up a booth, a Diversity Church booth, and they're having an Oktoberfest. And so there was no uh, safe drink for kids, even though kids were going to be out there. There was no non-alcoholic beverage. And so our church was like, hey, let's serve butterbeer to the kids. Take some cream soda, a little whipped cream, and, and just give those out to the kids. So while their parents are drinking alcoholic beverages, they got something to drink too. So we go out there and we're just hanging out with some people. And, and, and all of a sudden I hear that this, um, this food truck vendor that was the sole vendor for this Oktoberfest had backed out at the last minute. Now, how many of you guys know that at every Oktoberfest, if it's going to be a good party, what kind of food is going to be there? Hot dogs, bratwurst, sauerkraut, pretzels, right? That type of thing, all right? So when I thought to myself, oh, no, their vendor backed out. There's not going to be any sausages or hot dogs or anything. I thought to myself, what would be good bait to these people? Because after all, that's why we're out there. We're, we're out there to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, some good news. So what would be good news to a community event that just had their vendor back out on them? Hot dogs, amen. Catfish like hot dogs, people like hot dogs. Good news to somebody that don't have no hot dog at all is some hot dogs, amen. So I grabbed a couple people. We ran back to the church as fast as we could, grabbed our grill, went to Safeway, grabbed some bratwurst, grabbed some kraut. We even bought frozen pretzels to throw on the grill so we could serve some people that didn't have Oktoberfest food at their Oktoberfest. Guess what they said to me afterwards on Facebook publicly? Bates Hendricks' Facebook page shared to Diversity Church Indy's Facebook page that Diversity Church saved the day. Look at the terminology saved for a moment. We were just being Jesus to people. See, evangelism, it, it really is as simple as this. Find a need and meet it in Jesus' name. Oh, you want to talk about good bait and good tackle? What the church just needs to do instead of standing up and just trying to preach at people, I mean at them, all we got to do is actually start actually acting out the gospel and start finding needs... And be that need to somebody. That breaks down the barriers. That looks good to a lost person. Like, yeah, Jesus was a good guy. And I see you being a good guy. I kind of like that. Let me go see what that's all about. And the fish kind of swim up and they start smelling those hot dogs. And they're like, yeah, you know, I kind of like that hot dog. And then all of a sudden before they know it, they're all caught. And they're like, ooh, I like Jesus. Woo, you know, and they're swimming towards us. I just thought that was awesome because isn't that what Jesus did in the gospel? Think about the wedding at Cana for a moment. And you find this in John chapter 2. What did Jesus do to some people that needed wine? He turned water into wine. Some of you guys are really excited about that. <laughs> but before you get too excited about the wine, the Bible says you could drink wine. It was real wine because the Bible says in Ephesians, you know, chapter 5, that not to get drunk with wine. So you got to know the other side. So we could drink wine, but the other side of it is not get drunk with wine. So before you get too excited, know the both sides of the Bible. But Jesus did make wine. Why? Because this was a wedding feast and a wedding party. And it would have been terribly embarrassing for the host of that wedding for them to run out of wine. And so Jesus saw a need and he met that need. Can we just be disciples of Jesus and follow him like that in our communities? Guess what? It's going to be in no time before those folks that were there that night come and, and they begin to connect with Diversity Church. Yes, even here on a Sunday morning. Why? Because there's some good news over there. And it was demonstrated to them. That is being a good witness and using the right bait, even if that means some hot dogs. Hallelujah. Paul talks about the same thing in 1 Corinthians 9. In 1 Corinthians 9, we can read verses 20 through 23. It says this, and to the Jews, this is Paul talking. He's, he's talking about using the right bait and the right tackle, getting into knowing his fish and where they are and what kind of bait they like. It says, in the Jews, to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews, or since we're talking about fishing, catch a Jew. <laughs> 
to those. That probably didn't sound real uh, politically correct. I'm sorry. Sometimes Jesus wasn't politically correct, all right? To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Meaning their lifestyle, if that was like the Old Testament law, I'm going to just come under that. I'm going to look like that to them because I want to be a missionary. I want to put on flesh where those people are doing life, just like Jesus put on flesh and did life here in the world. I want to become one of them that I might win one of those under the law. To those who are without the law, meaning a Gentile who like bratwurst and bacon and all that type of stuff, I'm going to go to an Oktoberfest and I'm going to be like one of them. Not without under the law to God, meaning when we go out there, we're not compromising in our life. We're not, we're not going out there and sinning with them. We're just going out there and doing life with them and looking like them. So they're not like, I'm not going near that net. <laughs> I'm not going near that net. That's some, that's some creepy stuff. That's some weird Christianity, man. They're talking about propitiation and they're talking about, you know, all these terms that I don't know and fellowshipping. What is fellowshipping? And they're like, they're like, man, I don't know about all that. No, I'm going to become one of them. I'm going to use some of their language, maybe not the bad words, you know, but I'm going to just at least talk like them and begin to look like them and begin to, to just uh, do life with them. It's kind of like when Jesus was sending out his disciples, he told them when, he was go- when they were going to go out to different places, he said, eat what's set before you. Isn't that just as simple? See, missionary sometime is just go eat, going and eating what's set before you because that's what they eat. So if I deny what they're eating, then they're like, who's this guy? You too good for my food? You too good for my music? You too good for my culture? No, missionaries learn how to adapt to certain cultures and begin to look like those things in order to win those people. I was over at Prince and Gloria's house this last week, and he's from Ghana. And his dad uh, came into town and brought him some of his favorite snacks. Oyster jerky. Oysters, little tiny oysters that have been dried out and salted. Fish that have been fried and dried, salted, right? And you eat them whole, the the head and everything included. And you eat all the fins. Only thing they take off are the scales. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) And and I ate one of those. Why? Because I'm just trying trying to get on that level. I'm trying to connect with them. I want them to see that I can become one of you because I want you to understand. I want you to become a little bit of of this thing that I know of Jesus Christ in me, which is the hope of glory. And so I'm going to do life with people. That's what Paul's talking about. So to somebody who's not under the law, I'm not going to go and sin, but I'm going to become like one of them. Look at the next one. Look at the next verse. And it says, to the weak, I become weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things, he says, to all men that I might by all means save some. I'm going to use any bait in my tackle box to just share the gospel with people and, and put on that flesh. To where, whatever's going to be attracted to them so we can connect on the outside, I'm going to do that so then I can bring the real truth of the gospel that will save their life. So he says, I'm going to become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be a partaker of it with you. This is real missionology. This is real following Jesus. It's not just those people that are career missionaries. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, you're either a missionary as a Christian or you're an imposter. (laughs) Jesus said, follow me and you'll be fishers of men. So if you're not fishing for people, maybe you're not really following. That's what I'm saying here. This is real Christianity and God's calling you to be a missionary and put on somebody else's flesh right where they are. Isn't isn't it? Jesus left heaven, left the comforts of that, left all the culture of heaven. I don't know what they ate in heaven, but I guarantee you it was better than bratwurst we had. And he came down here and he was like, dude, like where are the, uh, where's the heavenly manna? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like he's leaving his culture behind to become a missionary, to put on flesh eat some crazy things maybe that he wasn't used to in heaven. I know that tree of life was way better (laughs) than anything we have here. I mean, I know I like some Haagen-Dazs ice cream, but that tree of life, whatever that thing is in heaven, it's way better. He, He decided to put that away and become a missionary to seek and save us who are lost. Can't you eat some fish heads? No, I can't do that, Pastor. Uh, Maybe that means following Jesus in that context. Maybe it does. 
you know, we were teaching our, our baby this, so she was with us, uh, Tavia, our six-year-old. You better believe Pastor made my daughter eat some fish head. I'm trying to teach her how to become a missionary. I gave her that lesson because I want her to be a follower of Jesus. So cool about Tavi, she was born on the mission field. We were missionaries in Brazil. I did not suffer with food in Brazil. That culture food, Brett, what do you know what I'm talking about? Man, the churrascaria, it's like fogo de chao every day. Jesus, I want to go there. Rio de Janeiro, the beach, hallelujah. I didn't suffer a lot in those areas. I just suffer, remember when I told you the mosquitoes and the Amazon and the Widowmaker uh, shower. But we got to be willing to put aside sometimes our culture just to embrace somebody else that's far away from God. And sometimes that means that we're going to put on some bait that looks like them, something appetizing to them. I wanted to share this with you all because this is going to go into our next, uh, this is a good segue into our next series. Um, Our next series is called Diversity. This is a catch word right now that is very popular in our culture, and for good reasons. And so we were thinking, okay, this is a good bait word, if you will. And it's not like a bait and switch, because guess what? Jesus ain't no switch. It's all right if we give bait if we're actually having something really good on the other side. I want you to catch that. So it's not a bait and switch. So we're using this word diversity because obviously it's a core value of ours, right? And we believe that heaven reflects the, uh, the diversity that God really created and wants to see every nation, every tribe, every tongue is going to be there. And so we're going to start this series, but along with it, we're going to start kind of an evangelistic campaign called IndieNeedsDiversity.com. Look at this, IndieNeedsDiversity.com. You guys recognize the colors in that logo? pretty sweet, right? You got the red and yellow and blue of our logo here at Diversity Church. And when people go to Indie Needs Diversity, there's going to be a landing page. And there's going to be a uh, diversity quiz on there that people can take that says, ask them a question like, when was the last time you had somebody from a different uh, culture come to your house and you guys had dinner together? And it's going to say, when was the last time you uh, hung out with some people that were um, that had a different sexual orientation than you? Things like that, right? It's this diversity word, yet then we're going to take them into the diversity website after that, and they can see how we're being Jesus and representing heaven on earth, the variety of heaven in this singular world, and it's just a way to kind of tell people how we're demonstrating the gospel, which is good news to the whole world. Yes, anybody, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in this sight, and it's just a way to share the gospel with some lost people. Who's excited about that? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So... Why Diversity Matters, there's going to be that quiz. There's also going to be merchandise, all right? Not so we can get rich so that we can spread the message. So there's going to be T-shirts to buy, hoodies to buy, hats to buy, even other things to give out, signage, yard signs to buy, so we can just spread the whole city of Indianapolis. And it's another way to share that we're spreading our church by going to Irvington, the east side of Indianapolis next, and then we're going to go to the north side, and then we're going to go to the west side, because Indy needs diversity church too. Why? Because they need Jesus, and he is the Lord of this church. Amen? All right, so let me talk to you about the last and final thing. The last tip I want to give you in this thing called fishing for people is that we got to remember to always set the drag. We got to always remember to set the drag. One time I was fishing in my mom's backyard where those big fish are and that like hot dogs. And so I had threw the line out, had a hot dog on the other end, and all of a sudden I got a bite, and this fish just takes off with this bait. And I set the hook, and I'm trying to pull it in, and all of a sudden my line just snapped. And I was so frustrated. Like, you know, if you ever had a fish on your line that got away, you're like, no. (laughs) You know know what I'm talking about? And so I was so frustrated, and what happened was I just didn't set the drag. Now, a drag on a fishing pole is basically what controls the tension in your line. So if you throw this thing out and there's a big fish, bigger fish need less tension or else they're going to snap the line. And I obviously had a Jonah and the Whale type of fish on my line. You know, fish stories are always exaggerated. (laughs) I obviously had a big fish on there because it snapped the line and and I didn't set my tension. I didn't set the tension. So that thing just snapped. Can I tell you what this means in this thing called fishing for people? Sometimes we just are preaching the gospel with too much contention. We got too much tension. And so we're trying to reach people, and we got a lot of zeal sometimes. But we're not matching that zeal with the knowledge of the love of God. 
that zeal has to be matched with knowledge or else we'll be a little bit too contentious trying to argue our point, trying to argue fish into the kingdom. That's not how evangelism works. The Bible says that we gotta be full of the Holy Spirit and a part of fooling, being filled with the Holy Spirit is that we are sensitive to the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the first fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Love. So I want you to think about this because when you're fishing for some lost people, one of the guys in our church uh, shared with me this after our first service. He was talking about how the bigger fish need more drag. That like the big tuna that you catch in the ocean, some of them need more drag. Some of it takes about eight to uh, six to eight hours to just wear these tuna out. And if you don't have that drag set, they'll snap the line. And then they'll go around with a hook in their mouth, just like that fish is in my mom's backyard. You know, just a hook in their mouth and, and they just snapped your line. And so you got to set that drag a lot, lot, with a lot less, less tension. I want you to think about the big fish in our communities, in our families, at your job, people that are so far away from God. Listen, we, we all too often try to clean the fish before we catch them. We try to go and just jab them and say, you need to look like this and you need to do this and that. No, give them a little space, all right? Let them see the love of God in you. Let them see, like St. Francis said, you know, I'm going to preach the gospel and I'll use words if necessary. Like show them the gospel first. And you do got to preach the gospel. Don't, don't get me twisted. You still got to open up your mouth and share the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. But sometimes we're too soon to preach the gospel. Kind of like Peter was. He was all zealous in that garden of Gethsemane with his sword. He pulled out his sword and he cut the ear off of Malchus, the high priest's servant's head. Just cut it off. And Jesus had to say, you know what, Malchus? Peter was just being a little too zealous. He said, Peter, put down your sword. All right? Put the ear back on, healed this servant's ear. Isn't that what Jesus is having to do to this world because of Christians? who were preaching even sometimes with good intention, but they were a little too contentious. And so now we got people all over this, this world that have the hook of the gospel in their mouth and their church hurt now. They don't want nothing to do with God. They don't want nothing to do with Christianity because those people, those, those people of God are just so angry. Like the people, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church. Oh, you hear how I said that? I just didn't like it. Like, ah! You know, these are the type of people that Jesus was most contentious with. Were people like this, were people that stand out on the street corner saying, God hates fags. I know that's really intense, but this is what they say. And they put it on signs. And they, and they go to funerals uh, of people that served our country. And they'll be out there with these signs in the name of God. It's just too much tension. Listen, God loves all people, number one, so that ain't even the gospel. But some people even will share the gospel with the same type of tension. Oh, you need a turn to burn. Guys, okay, if, if, okay, that's the truth. Okay, if you don't turn from your sin and accept what Christ did on the cross, yes, there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. But can you just watch how you're speaking? We're turning away people and they're getting hurt by churches and they got these hooks in their mouth and they're running all over the world saying, I hate church because of it. It's because of us who are supposed to be followers of Jesus. <laughs> the bigger fish it is, the more tension, the more, the more drag we need to have just to give them some patience. And let me just say this before I end the sermon this morning. Can we just be patient with the people that God's bringing into this church? Because some of the people that are here on Sunday mornings have just started kind of like saying, I kind of like this. But then they come in here and they're like, whoa, what is going on maybe? Or they, maybe they got somebody that's a little upset with them. I, I'll never forget this. Just uh, I would say in the last year, somebody was mad that a baby was crying in church and told the, the young lady with her babies because she wasn't ready to put them in the nursery yet. Oh, man, there's a nursery. You need to put your baby in the nursery. Would you just be patient with somebody? These people are coming from a lost world and they're looking for hope. If they come to church and they don't find hope, where are they going to find it? Wow. Set the drag. Just be patient with some people. Listen, it's not our job to clean the fish. It's God's job. Let them just wear themselves out until they find out that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. This is what 2 Timothy 2.24 says, and I'll end it with this. 2 Timothy 2.24 says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. 
This is answering the call to follow Jesus. You don't you don't have to be quarreling. Oh, the Jesus and the Bible's right. Okay, yes, it is. Would you just calm down and sit down and, and just stop talking? <laughs> a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. <laughs> Some of the hardest people to catch are the most difficult people out there. But I'm going to set the drag. I'm going to let them wear themselves out. Until they start finding out that alcohol ain't the answer, drugs ain't the answer, women ain't the answer, men ain't the answer, Jesus is the answer. And that takes sometimes days or hours, but we're going to reel them in. We're going to reel them in and we're going to be patient with them in the process. That's diversity, church. And that's why we're catching tuna and catfish and mahi-mahi and bluegill, we're catching them all because we're just going to do what God tells us to do in the gospel. We're going to just follow Jesus, and we're going to follow the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going to follow his methodology, and we're going to become missionaries, and we're going to go to where people are, and lost people are going to get saved because of it. And when we get to heaven, there will be a massive party because we all did what Jesus told us to do. We answered the call. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes with me?